Um, <clears throat> really nice to to have this opportunity. I just want to echo Rabbi's words before we get going. I mean, my father was president of United Synagogue um, in the early 90, in the late 80s and early 90s and appointed um, Rabbi Sachs as chief rabbi. He was the chair of that selection committee. I used to speak, he used to speak to him every week and I, I also got to know him quite well through that. Um, and it, it is a tremendous loss and it feels like, a, you know, so many people I think it's going to feel like a personal loss as well. So really appreciate you saying something about it there, Rabbi. It's really important for us as a community. But anyway, to move on, it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with you, Dan. So I'll just say a couple of words about um, Dan, and then we're going to invite him to just say a little bit about his book, and then we'll have a, a bit of a discussion. And then I think Steve, Stephen Feldman will manage uh, any Q&A towards the end. But just, um, so Dan is um, a historian of the Second World War. He specialised in um, Jews in in the in Jews of France and North Africa. Uh, his first book, which I think came from your PhD, Dan, if I'm right, um, Petan's Jewish Children, French Jewish Youth and the Vichy Regime, that came out in 2014. And um, this book that we're going to talk about, um, the uh, uh, SS Officers Armchair, is his second book. And um, I I'm already envious about the likely sales that he gets for this book, which uh, I imagine have already outstripped books of mine that have been in print for 20 years. Um, he's um, uh, currently, uh, as, as well as promoting this book, he's currently working on uh, projects to do with Jews in Tunisia. Um, and uh, I, the, the main project, I, at least according to your website, Dan, that, that you're leading on is this funded project on traces of Jewish memory in contemporary Tunisia. So, I mean, really interesting to hear that. I think, I think we probably won't have time to talk about that tonight, but it's worth knowing that when that one project comes to fruition, it might be very interesting to have you back again to do that. I mean, Dan is a graduate of Sussex, of, um, of Oxford. He had a postdoc fellowship at Oxford. He's been a fellow, uh, visiting fellows at um, European University Institute, Yad Vashem, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, he was at the University of Sheffield, and now he's at Queen Mary University of London. But um, much more important than all that is that um, Dan is married to uh, Robert and Tony Marcus's youngest daughter, Elizabeth, who I think is on this call, though, hiding herself, um, and she, herself an outstanding scholar. So they, these are our intellectual golden couple of, um, of, of, of Anglo-Jewish history and literary studies. Anyway, Dan, what I wanted to start with um, was just to give you an opportunity to say something about the book. And I thought maybe you could tell people um, in, in a way, the hook, which is what brought you into this project, the initial finding, which in fact gives, gives the book its title. And then maybe you could just say something about what, what you think you've done with this book. And I suppose I'm especially interested um, when reading the book, it, it's a very, very accessible book. So you've clearly written it, not just, even though it's, it's a scholarly book and lots of, of end notes and so on, um, but it's clearly uh, um, also written for an audience of interested lay people, not, non, not specialist historians. So as well as taking us into it, maybe you could say just a few words about what you want people to take away from this book and maybe what feelings you want them to be left with. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for agreeing to, to do this. And thanks to Stephen Feldman uh, for the invitation. And that was, a, that was a, such a long question. I didn't actually manage to write all of it down. So you might have to sort of uh, pick me up if I, if I forget to answer it in any way. But I suppose to answer the initial question, this is a book, um, well, the story came to me, essentially. I, like you said, I just, I had finished my PhD in England and I found myself in Italy, in Florence, uh, looking to do new research on the Second World War. And I didn't know anybody in Florence. I'd only just moved there to the university. And a couple of us sort of got together and organized a little gathering for other people at the faculty uh, at the university. And it was at, on, at this occasion that somebody uh, came up to me and I didn't know her. And she, she sort of just said, oh, you're, you're that new historian who works on the Second World War. Um, I've really, I really want to talk to you about something because something has just happened to my mother. And, you know, when, when, when you're a historian of the Second World War, people often want to share stories with you. They tell you about grandparents who were in the resistance or, or aunts who were deported. But, you know, usually these things occurred a long time ago, 70 years ago. These things don't just happen to people's mothers. 
And so she just told me there and then how, um, so she was, she, her mother uh, lives in Amsterdam and she had recently taken this old armchair to be upholstered. And when she went to collect it a few days later, the guy doing the work was, was quite cross with her. And he sort of said, well, you know, what is this? I don't do work for Nazis or their families. And he just presented her with a, a bundle of documents that he had discovered sewn into the cushion of the armchair, all of which belonged to one man who was stationed in Prague during the Second World War. And all of the documents were sort of, you know, covered with SS, um, with, with Nazi era stamps, swastika things, etc. And everything was in the name of somebody called Robert Griesinger. And the woman sort of stood there in the middle of the shop and she just had no idea what this guy was talking about because she'd never seen these papers before. She had no idea who Robert Griesinger was. He wasn't her father, uh, which is what the, the upholsterer had presumed. She, she had not inherited the chair. She'd bought the chair when she was a student in 1960s Prague. She, she was sort of at the university and like all of us just needed a few bits of bits and pieces to furnish her student digs. So one day she sort of went around the old town and bought uh, tables, chairs, desks, what have you. And then in the 1980s, when some families were allowed to leave communist Czechoslovakia, she took this armchair with her on the train to the Netherlands. And it's always, she's always had it uh, ever since. It was whenever you sort of looking at family photos from sort of the 80s and 90s, you kind of see this chair in the background. Anyway, so th this woman came up to me at this party in, uh, in, in Florence and just said, well, you know, I really want to understand, like, who is this Robert Griesinger and how did his documents end up inside my armchair, which, you know, I, I did my homework on my entire life. It's, I just don't understand how, how anything like this could happen. So that's basically how the story begins. Uh, and, you know, I, I was fascinated. I was absolutely uh, hooked. And, I, you know, I, of course, I wanted to know as much as I could about this man, but also about the chair. I was really, really interested in this object and what the what the object could tell me uh, about the past. And so I sort of printed out dozens of photographs in color of this armchair. I think we might have a picture of the armchair, uh, Stephen, possibly. I think perhaps we might be able to show people. So I sort of printed out dozens of color pictures of this armchair and just went to Prague and went, went around the streets of the old town of Prague with this photo, huge, blown up, and just went in and out of different chair makers, different atelier upholsterers, and just asking them for as much information as I could about the object. You know, I wanted to know who had made it, how much it cost, who was the intended or, uh, buyer? Was it made in Germany and taken to Prague or was it lo locally produced? Had it, had it been one of these objects we know that had once belonged to a Jewish family? We know that tens of thousands of objects pieces of furniture were taken from the Netherlands, from Belgium, from France, when Jews were deported. And these objects were shipped east in order to either furnish the homes of German families whose, whose houses had been bombed, or to furnish the new offices, which were sort of Nazi offices that were springing up all over Central and Eastern Europe. So, you know, I would take this picture uh, and a lot of people very quickly were, were able to tell me that this uh, was definitely a Czech made chair. It wasn't a particularly expensive chair, especially not today. So going in and out of chair makers shops, I would see dozens of these chairs, but they would be sort of right at the back of the shop. Certainly not, you know, it was as cheap as chips, not a collectible item uh, in any sense. Uh, but I think in order to try and get a bit more history from it, I would, I would sort of, I remember asking one of the guys um, you know, I said, oh, you know, inside of this cushion, I discovered these Nazi documents. And the guy just wasn't phased at all. I remember on one occasion, some, some guy, he just sort of took a puff on his cigarette and he sort of said, sir, this was communist Czechoslovakia, for God's sake. I find hidden objects inside of, inside of chairs, inside of mattresses every single day. This is no big deal for, for me, which is obviously completely different to the reaction of the chair maker in Amsterdam. But anyway, so while I was in Prague, while I was trying to find out about the history of the chair, I also was going to the archives every day and trying to find out as much as I could about this man, because all I had were these pages, which I think we might actually have a picture of, us, um, of one of the documents which was discovered inside the armchair. So the papers 
they were deeply, deeply personal papers, the kind of papers you can't live without. Uh, so we're talking passports, uh, which were still valid up until the end of the war, uh, PhD certificates in law, stocks and shares that had never been cashed, war bonds, all th those kinds of things. So we might have uh, a picture somewhere of this passport, but if not, don't worry, but it will come eventually. Anyway, so the I went to the archives and I just sort of, I was actually amazed at how, how wonderful the condition of the archives were in, in the Czech Republic, unlike in France, where I'm used to, where um, it's a lot of sort of computer says, no, sorry, we don't have these, we, or this was destroyed, or this was weeded out after the Second World War. The archives in Prague were, were simply fantastic. I was able to really get my hands on a lot of good material about this man. And I suppose it was at that moment that my interest in the chair itself suddenly sort of waned and I became um, more interested in tracing his history because it was there in the archives in Prague, I was able to establish that this guy was, what he was doing in Prague, which was not simply um, just working for, uh, what, working as a lawyer for one of the ministries, which is what the documents in the chair had led me to presume. Actually, he was in the SS. And I suppose at that moment I thought, oh gosh, you know, this is, this is quite, this isn't just any old person. Uh, so I wanted to, to probe his history a little bit more. Do you think we might be, did we, were we able to share that picture of the passport? Did that come up at all? Yeah, I can do it, hold on. Oh, thanks. So, so once, once I had more of this biographical information about him uh, from the archives in Prague, I was then able to take this information with me to Germany. So here we have one of the documents, for example, a uh, passport from 1942, and I also have other ones uh, from subsequent years. And you see a very tall, handsome man, big, big um, uh, scar. The, you can't see it too well in this picture, but he has a big scar running across his, his left cheek, which I was fascinated by, uh, wanted to know more about. Again, uh, no indication that he's married, no indication that he has any children. Um, so again, as I was saying, so I went to Berlin, which is where they keep the archives of the SS. And as I said earlier, so many archives were destroyed by the Nazis, um, also by allied bombing. So it's, it's, it sometimes is very, very difficult to conduct work um, in, in, in Germany and, and elsewhere due to either allied bombings or by the fact that in April, 1945, the SS and other organizations were just burning all of their documents. So most of the documents of the SS, for example, did not survive the war. Uh, only about a third of the individual SS files actually remain. So I was very fortunate that when I got to the SS archives in Berlin, I was able to actually have Griesinger's dossier, his file that sort of charted so much wonderful information, biographical information about him, about the woman he was trying to marry, uh, about his involvement in the SS. And this sort of gave me names of, 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 of it, it told me he had two daughters, which I didn't even know about until then. And it just proved very, very difficult, which is often the case when you're tracing women in history to, to sort of track these people down. I wasn't able to, I only had their maiden names. It was very difficult for, for me to find anything more out, more about them because they had married and, and moved on. They were little girls in the 1930s and 40s. So after, after doing archival work in Berlin, I went to Stuttgart, which is the city where he was from. I got more and more information about him from Stuttgart. And then I suppose at one point in Stuttgart, I think I was so frustrated from having, having found so much silence in the archives about, about him. And, and, and I wanted to know more about him and his life and his personality and background that I, I just reached for the phone book and, and phoned everybody in Stuttgart with the last name Griesinger until somebody eventually said, oh yes, that was my father's brother. W why are you interested in him? And this was a really, really important moment for me in the research in the book, because um, they invited me, the, the Robert Griesinger's nephew invited me to his house in Stuttgart, which is the same house that Robert, it's a family house, which Robert had also lived in. And it's one of these houses where sort of nothing has been thrown out ever. These, this is like proper hoarder territory. Um, so again, I was able to, to interview family members, find out about Robert Griesinger's daughters, 
And then eventually, once they built trust in me, I was able to have access to scores of sort of family papers, including, I think we might have a picture, uh, um, Stephen, of, um, of his mother's diary, which was a really magnificent uh, treasure trove. She, his mother, Robert Griesinger, kept a diary from the day he was born and just wrote in it every single day. I think, uh, Stephen Feldman, it's the third picture I sent you, if, if you're able to. But, you know, we're talking page after page every day, her writing about her son. But I feel I feel like I'm over-talking now, um, and I'm not sure it's, if I'm... It's, uh, we'll just have a look at this. Ah, we don't seem to be seeing it here. Okay, S Steve, you take us out of that picture because it's not quite the one that, that Dan had in mind. Thanks. Oh, well, thanks, Dan. That's that, that, that was a fantastic beginning. Um, we'll leave my long question till the end. It was a question about what you want people to take from this, but I think it's, maybe that's a better ending than beginning. But some, the way in which you just described that um, raised something for me, um, which I really felt reading the book as well. It reminded me, actually, of um, another book where I think it's in the same, in some ways, in the same genre, um, and making big waves recently, at least, Philippe Sound's Rat Run book. Um, and in both of them, um, both in your book and in his, I mean, he's an, a lawyer, obviously, but he's come to history through his interest in the development, historical development of laws, you know, and you are a professional historian, but both of you do something in a way quite similar, I suppose I can only say methodologically, which is that you're very present in your historical accounts. It's as if, in a way, you even present them as a kind of detective story. You know, in his case, um, it's uh, what happened to Otto von Fechter, how did he die? In your case, it's how did these papers get into this armchair? And um, what was what was behind them? Who was the person behind them? What can you find out? And um, it's a fascinating story, but it, it also structures your account. So we learn a lot about you. And also, you're kind of an implicated detective. I just want to read two or three lines from, um, uh, from one of the chapters of the book, which is about a link between Griesinger and your family, at least a possible link. So you're talking about um, members of your family who are in a place called um, Stavysh, is that mm -hmm, how you said? Mm -hmm. um, which is in Ukraine. 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 And uh, you've been tracing the journey, the direction of the um, unit, the, the, the Wehrmacht unit, actually, that, that Griesinger is attached to and its movements around that area. And, and basically the Jews of that, that town are wiped out. And you say, even if Griesinger did not personally round up and execute my ancestors and other Jews, he was in close proximity to their killers. He would have known their faces, if not their names. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very moving moment, but it's also um, a kind of indicative moment that, that you're kind of, there's a personal motivation as well as historical professional motivation. So just before we get into some of the substance of what you found, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on um, what it means to present history as a kind, in this kind of detective genre in which you're very prominent and we learn lots about you and we think, oh, why do you want, you know, it's a kind of, exciting story, I did this, I did that, I found this lead, I found this this dead end. Can you just say a bit about yeah. that? No, of course, and, and, and what an honor to be compared to Philippe Sands, uh, who, I, exactly, I, I completely agree with you. It really, you do get a sense in his writing, definitely, um, of the historian, well, as, as the scholar, uh, as detective, but I don't think, um, you know, I think that there, this is now, in the last 10 years, I can think of other, other examples too, of, of professional academics who do, um, sort of put themselves into their narrative to drive it forward in, in lots of ways. I think some, some people do do this better than others. I think sometimes you get some, some people who sort of, you know, I, I walked up the stairs, I turned left, I gasped. You know, and that's when I was writing, I was very conscious that I didn't want to be one of those people. So it, it, it was, as, as I was writing, it was, I was very aware of this and I didn't want to be um, making it too much about me, because I think the subject is much more interesting. Uh, but nevertheless, I did, there was always, as you've said, the fact that my family was involved and the fact that um, the, the chair is really the gatekeeper and is the thing that's controlling so much of this story, I felt I had no choice really, but to sort of structure the book in such a way in which it, it might seem like some kind of journey, potentially a journey of, of, of discovery. And it is as, it, you know, it, it did at times feel slightly uncomfortable writing in the first person, uh, but hopefully the readers won't think 
uh, that I that I overdid it in any way. No, I, I don't think so at all. I think it's really striking, and it's right at the end of the book, if I remember rightly. You take some of the papers to show your grandmother, mm -hmm. and basically she says, "I don't want take I I you know I knew you were a historian, but I never knew you would have papers stamped." with the swastika all over them and SS over them, take them away, yeah? yeah? I don't want them in my house. So it's a kind of, um, I don't know how to put it really, but it's a very point, again, another very poignant moment in which the um, collision between your professional identity and the kind of personal history that leads you to this moment, you know, in your professional life right. becomes becomes very uh, affect later. And it's a very deeply emotional moment. Well, the same, this had never happened to me before. Because you know, my, as you said earlier, my 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 previous research was on Jews in Vichy France and on Jews mm. in Tunisia, and this was never intended. This book to in any way be anything about me or my family. You know, other people's families are so much more interesting than mine. You know, I always thought I'm a professional historian. I'm going to stick to these documents. I work on France or on 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 other places which have nothing to do with my family. Because when you when I trace my family tree vertically. You know, my grandparents were born in this country. Their parents weren't involved in the Holocaust. So it's very easy for me to sort of, and for most British Jews, I think, to think, oh, well, we're not connected because, you know, we're here and that's the end of that. But I think when you start to look more horizontally, mm -hmm. you say, well, exactly. okay, your grandpa is here, but what about his brother or sister? What about his mm -hmm. uncles? What about his cousins? That's mm -hmm. when you start to find these connections. And so, as you mentioned, with, with, the, with the Shtetl Stavisha, my, my job as the historian, I felt, was to follow Griesinger and to find out everything I could about him that was significant. And so there I was. I mean, we've, we, we, we're jumping around a bit, but to, to give some people a bit of a sense of his trajectory, in the 1930s, Griesinger, um, he graduated from high school. He wasn't a great student. He, he went to university. He then became a lawyer. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping forward uh, quite a lot. Did a PhD in law and joined the SS and the Nazi party, worked at the Gestapo as a lawyer. And then we get to the end of the 1930s and he's in the Wehrmacht. He's really not very happy about this because somebody with his background, PhD in law, with such a good family, you know, he was really expecting a better posting than the <laughs> Wehrmacht. So he fights in the campaign in France. He goes and then comes back to Stuttgart. And then in June 1941, he, his unit, his entire unit from Stuttgart is told to go east. And the men in his unit are completely confused. They don't understand why they are going east. They find themselves on the border of the Soviet Union. And they're thinking, well, but, oh, and the, the archives are very clear that the letters home, the diaries, the memoirs, they're very, very explicit about this point. They think that they are probably going to, oh, well, we, you know, we've got this agreement with Stalin, so we're obviously not attacking the Soviet Union, so we must be going to, oh, Stalin must be letting us through, we must be going to Palestine or British India. So some of these guys are going out buying language books in Arabic or in Farsi. The, the last thing on their mind was an invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941. It was a total secret for everybody, especially for Stalin, because we know that he sort of went off into a in retreat for more than a week and wasn't seen. But anyway, so I'm plotting Griesinger's movements through Poland, through Ukraine, every village he comes across. And what's amazing is that the, the way in which, and you know, I'm not the first historian to do this, many others have done it brilliantly in the last few years, is to show the way in which ordinary soldiers, Wehrmacht soldiers, were, in, were totally involved in uh, the persecution against the local Jewish population. So, so many years after the war, there was this idea that the German soldiers, the Wehrmacht, were conducting a gentlemanly war, that they were just fighting against the Red Army, and that any Jews or, com or, or, or other so-called enemies who were killed, it was nothing to do with the Wehrmacht, it was professional killing squadrons. Whereas when we actually look nitty gritty at these individual units in the Wehrmacht, we see that within days of entering Ukraine, Griesinger, men in his unit are responsible ordinary soldiers for rounding up and killing the local Jewish population. So I'm plotting this route. And then all of a sudden we come across Stavisha, which is where my great grandfather. Um, so I think we had we had Keith on earlier, one of a, a distant relative of mine. So so Keith knows my grandmother, Keith and Stephanie, who are on the call. So it's very nice to see them. So it's my grandmother's father who who left uh, Ukraine and came to Britain. But as I said earlier, his, his, what, what happened to the rest of his family? 
So at this moment, when I'm seeing that Griesinger is in this shtetl in June, July, sorry, 1941, this is like a wake up call for me. And I really wanna sort of go and talk to my grandmother and go to the archives and find out what on earth happened to these other relatives who didn't make it out of Ukraine. And Griesinger found himself there in July, 1941. So this is how I get interested in the family history. It's thanks to this, you know, chilling coincidence that I would definitely was not foreseeing. It's fantastic. It's such an interesting story. And it, it um, as I say, it breaks down these barriers as if you're, you know, somehow accidentally you've suddenly ended up with your history of your own family, just as you're exploring this person who seems to have a totally random entry into your life. It's really interesting. Uh, a couple of things I want to pick up in what you just said. Um, and, and we are jumping about, but we've got a short time and, and a, a book full of things that we could talk about. But you, you, you talked just then about the Wehrmacht and the way in which they um, at least knew everything that was going on, but actually were also complicit. They were complicit in, in, in a variety of passive and active ways. Yeah. And, and, and I'm interested there in your view, actually. Um, I mean, as I think you said at the beginning, there, there was a, a sort of um, post-war story narrative that came from Germany a, a double victimhood narrative actually on the one hand we were we Germans were victims of the allies on the other hand we were also victims of the Nazis it was forced on us and there was a poor a few bad Nazis who some somehow hoodwinked the whole nation but 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 as you know this well you know this much better than I do a lot of historical work has has gone into that and I see your book as as, as contributing to the breaking down of that claim that there was not um, the involvement of well we'll come back to the idea of an ordinary Nazi in a minute maybe in relation to Greece but actually ordinary Germans yeah. You know, now, that, now, of course, the most the most famous, you know, argument about that was uh, uh, Goldhagen's um, um, uh, Hitler's willing executioners argument, which I know is is very, very controversial. Yeah. Um, which claimed, in a sense, that everybody was involved. Everybody. Yeah, everybody was happening. Wanted, yeah. Everybody wanted to kill the Jews. Yeah. And that's not. You couldn't read that out of your book, but you could read something about how you know people could not take refuge in the in the claim that there was a separate group of people who did the bad things and the rest of them didn't know what was going on or were just forced to go along with it. I mean, is that how you see it? And, and I suppose the question at the end of that is, what do you think about this uh, issue about whether, how far culpability spread? Gosh, what a question. Um, yeah, sorry, but there you no, go, no, I've only got no, a few like, minutes. <laughs> no, I mean, look, at the end of the day, this is something that I, I thought about a lot when it eventually, it came to me meeting Griesinger's daughters and I would spend a lot of time with them and corresponding with them and talking to them and thinking about their father and, and his role. Look, it's no surprise, it's no sort of spoiler for me to tell members of Muswell Hill Synagogue that um, Griesinger died in 1945. I say that in the first page of the book. So what's interesting for me is what happened next because his daughters W w then grew up without a father and how were they to make sense of him how were they to make sense of his choices of his motivations etc and what was amazing for me talking to them and then obviously doing the research around it was this sort of this wall of silence that would have cut, sprung up after 1945 so you know a whole generation of young people when they came of age and they wanted to ask their parents about what they had done in the war or, or 1930s or 1940s in Germany, there was just constant sort of avoidance. There were these strategies mm. that people put in place. Oh, don't mm. ask your father, you're making your father yeah. cry. I mean, tell, tell, maybe tell people down about the nest Bushmutzer business. You know, oh, like, the um, fouling uh, your nest. Fouling yeah. in your, oh yes, you don't want to like bring bad stuff to, to the table, basically, you, you know, leave, leave what's it, how would we even say that in English? Like leaving somebody else's business out, like mind your own business. We don't want um, our family's reputation to be somehow uh, muddied or sullied by this. So, you know, we just don't want, you know, people, as I said, they develop strategies not to talk about the past. And this was something that Griesinger's daughters, you know, they tried and tried to find out about their father, um, but they were just like, you know, uh, this entire generation of, of children who couldn't. Um, and, you know, it was a very, it was an easy environment for them to kind of grow up with all these silences. Like you've got the Adenauer government in the late 1940s in Germany. Mm. He is amnestying Nazis like there's no tomorrow. You know, there were eight 
million Nazi members in 1945, eight million. And yet there's something only between 1945 and the late 1950s, there were only 6,000 convictions. You know, this is a drop in the ocean when you, when you start looking at the, you know, the number of people who had actually been a part of, of this regime. Um, what effect do you think that had? I mean, I was struck, again, it's a shocking thing. It's in your book, it, again, it's in Robert Free's book, um, Not In My Family, very similar. And of course, in the book that you quote a lot, Mary Fulbrook's wonderful book, mm, Reckonings, amazing. which looks basically, it's not just the Germans, though, was it? It was also the Allies, the British in particular, and the Americans, who basically gave up on a denazification pro um, uh, process very quickly once they saw the enemy as again being the Soviet Union and the Cold War came. So we had a process in pretty much pretty soon after the war where Nazis, so-called ex-Nazis, I suppose, were, rec were recruited into the whole fabric of West Germany, of the Federal Republic of Germany, in the judiciary, in the universities, in medicine and so on. What do you think the effect of that has been? Well, I think, sorry, I just like you just made me think of something. And I, I that is that had Giesinger lived after 1945, I have He would have been a bureaucrat. Mm. There's absolutely no doubt <laughs> about it. He wouldn't, he would not have even had a slap on the wrist. Mm. The mm. fact that he was in the SS, the fact that he was in the Gestapo, the fact that he was responsible in Prague for horrific um crimes against the local Czech population, deporting so many Czech workers uh to Germany. So for, for somebody like that, it just, you know. The, there was no, there was no, no file on him at all after the war. So people in Stuttgart didn't know that he was dead, and yet they weren't even interested in pursuing him. Like he, mm -hmm. he was a middle rank Nazi. That for the end, at the end of the war, it was only sort of the very, very big ones at the top that people were interested in catching. But for the rest, a lot of these people were allowed to just go move on with their lives. Like we see, for example, one of the people who um, Giesinger was working with extremely closely in Prague during the Second World War, the, the other lawyer in his office. He went on to become the West German ambassador for Sweden. Like this was, there was almost total rehabilitation. And again, this is the same, it's the same in France. Uh, it's the same in lots of other places. This, this mm -hmm. desire to sort of move on, rebuild after, after a traumatic period of four or five years and, you know, not make it, just to try to put water under the bridge. And what do you think the effect of that has been? On, on contemporary Germany today. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think, I think there's whew, a lot of silences in families still mm. to this day. That's mm. something that I, I found time and again with my research. I think when interviewing these, these elderly women now, you know, it was amazing how they were just able to their entire lives not ever find out about their father even though they could have done you don't need to be a historian a professional historian to you know visit an archive or 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 make a few calls but for mm. me it was just amazing that so many people have just have this wall in front of them and that it's only now that they're probably at the end of their lives now that they're in their you know in their 80s that because I've come into their life with this story about their father but they're finally engaging with it I mean one of the most uh, amazing moments for me, which happened multiple times, was, you know, when I would do my oral history work for my for my last book or, or any oral history, I would come to somebody's house, I would interview them, they would respond, we might have a cup of tea, and then I would go home. But in this time, every single uh, conversation we would had, I would ask my questions, they would give me answers, and then there would be this role reversal where they would ask me a ton of questions because they wanted to know as much as they could about their father. Their mother remarried straight after the war and they just, they, she had more children and there were no fo photographs ever of her, of their father. So these girls just grew up in this environment where they, they tried to ask these questions and they couldn't and then they just, they just suddenly gave up. And what's interesting is the way that this has this has then sort of gone down a generation to the, the the granddaughters of these Nazis, and I think that so many in Germany, well, I think so many second generation are willing to at least sort of say, okay, I I, I understand the situation. It must have been horrific, um, 
but I, I take on board what you're saying. And you think my, people are willing to say that? Yeah, and I feel that Philippe Sand's case study is rather exceptional, oh. where he's found somebody who is constantly trying to say, no, my fa you're completely wrong, Philippe, my father didn't do this, or you're misreading the documents, or haha, you know, I've got, I feel that that guy is not typical. I think that most people who are children of Nazis, they do accept what their fathers or mothers had done. But when we come to the third generation, I think that's where we see a difference. So for example, Griesinger's grandchildren, the one who I have interviewed, born 20 years after he died, never even met him, was much less reluctant to accept the information that I was giving her. Oh, he didn't know what he was doing, or he probably did that because he was ordered to, you know, for her. And this is very common now. We see this time and time again, sort of in third generation perpetrator families in Germany. People sort of, you know, grandpa, grandma didn't know what they were doing. Leave them alone. Don't ask these questions. Actually, this is really interesting, and it's a bit different from what you find in some of the psychoanalytic literature on this, but I won't bore you with that, but just to, you know, on second and third generations. But what what I'm very interested in that. So you, are you saying there's been, there's a reversion in the third, to denial in the third generation? I'm not saying denial. I'm just saying that the reactions that Philippe Sands has found with his particular character in the who I think is more of a one-off. That's right. he, he seems to be much more common with third generation. But again, even just thinking about these terms, you know, you, you've you've looked at it. But I think most people, when we're talking about generations, we think about victims. We think about Holocaust second generation. Now we think it, we look in the United States for all of these third generation um, uh, uh, sort of movements that have sprung up in the last few years. The grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who are now forming associations. I think when we think about perpetrators we don't think about second or third generation as much. Scholars have not sort of spent as much time thinking about that. Although you mention, uh, for instance, um, Gabriela Schwab's book on that, which is about that, isn't it? It's the Haunted Le Haunting Legacies book. I think, I don't know if I do mention, I think that came out just after mine. I might be wrong, but I feel that- Oh, I thought you did. Uh, anyway, let's move, <laughs> Never mind that one. Um, just, um, there's again, such a lot of interesting things in there, but maybe people will be, particularly interested uh, have, uh, in something I haven't really given you a chance to talk about yet, which is what you've learned about the nature of the SS through following him during recent years. So, I mean, when I started this project, I honestly thought that most, you know, and I'm, I am a scholar of the Second World War, but nevertheless, I truly thought that the SS, was, to be in the SS meant you had to wear the uniform every day, you went around wearing black, it was a full-time job, um, but I think the biggest takeaway for me when, when actually researching these SS characters like Riesinger is that far from it, these guys paid their membership fees, they attended meetings once or twice a month, and it was really up to them, uh, their level of engagement. They were never sort of, you know, obviously if you worked in a concentration camp or you were one, in one of the main SS offices, then yes, you would wear your uniform every day. But for most of these doctors, lawyers, civil servants like Riesinger, for a lot of them, it was very much a sort of, it was, I don't want to say a social club, but, you know, they would be encouraged to bring their wives, bring their children uh, to various events. Um, people, people got promoted very, very quickly if they got very involved with the SS. But this wasn't Griesinger's case. Griesinger barely got involved unless he wanted to get uh, a better position for himself elsewhere. So for him, it really, I mean, look, he came from such a conservative background. He, you know, his mother's diary, it's so clear that they would never have voted for the Nazi party. These were deeply monarchist, um, conservative, military uh, people. They had plenty of other extreme right parties to choose from. They wouldn't have been interested in the Nazis. So Griesinger himself, when it comes, he, you know, he was never a member of the Nazi party when, when Hitler comes to power. Griesinger joins the Nazi party in 1937. He joins the SS in 1933. He's a member of the SS mm -hmm. before the party uh, because for him, it's a way in. The Nazis in March 1933, they said no more members are allowed. They said, oh, no, you don't. We're not having any last, mi last minute people come in and try and, and sort of say that you were there from the beginning. So for him to advance his career as a lawyer, a civil servant in Nazi Germany, he really needed to show his allegiance 
to the new regime, but he couldn't. But given his pedigree, given this PhD in law from one of the best institutions, from the best universities, Tübingen uh, in Germany, he, he and the people he met at Tübingen. I mean, one of the things I haven't been able to talk about, and I think Stephen Feldman, we might have a picture of a, a, a fencing. I don't know if you're able to show this. So this is actually how he obtained his scar. He became one of he became part of one of these uh, dueling societies. These very sort of old nineteenth century um, associations. I'm not sure if that's worked. Uh, Stephen Frosch, can you see it? No, it's just got a couple of lines. It's not, yeah. it's okay, not no, working no, properly. But it's a picture that basically explains how somebody like Griesinger would have got this scar on his cheek. You know, for, for, a, for this entire generation of men, it was very important, you know, masculinity, virility, etc., to have this sort of this, this, this mark on your face. So he would have on his first duel, most likely have sort of encouraged. Um, uh, well done. Yeah, he would have. So this is a picture from 1931 of his exact um his exact fencing group so you know he would have like he would have been, had his 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 flesh torn from his face and at that point would have reached for the salt and, and rubbed salt into the wound in order to to bring it out but anyway i'm di i'm digressing here in the in um <laughs> i see we don't have too long left but just to finish this point um the people he met at university it was so important for him these were the contacts that were going to propel him uh into better positions later in his life when we get to um his life as a lawyer in a stuttgart and then when we get to prague so many of these characters are re-emerging he's able to get this position in prague thanks to one of these university fencing contacts they really were a brotherhood who protected each other yeah thanks again but the it's really interesting to see this thing about a low level invert or middling level SS person. It's, it's, you know, he's a bureaucrat in many ways and yet implicated in so much that goes on. Uh, um, uh, there are loads of other things to talk about, but perhaps it would be good to hear uh, something about this. I mean, if we talk, you, you already described how he, he's kind of careerist who, who joins the SS partly for his career, but he's also pretty steeped in a certain kind of, um, both monarchist and anti-Semitic um, terrain. Um, could you say a bit about what what you what you think you found about this this SS man's, you know, modest SS man's attitude to Jews? Yeah, I mean, somebody like Griesinger, there is absolutely no doubt, and this this is clear from his mother's diary, would have been part of this generation of young men, mainly men who would have totally blamed, I mean, his generation in itself was totally marked by the end of the First World War. He was born between, he was born in 1906. And like all of these Nazis that we find in the top, right at the top and in all these sort of very important positions, they're almost always born between 1900 and 1910. They're this war youth generation that was too young to fight in the First World War, but the First World War completely marked their lives. It totally, it, it, it shattered them. It was really the end of their world. There was no way they thought, you know, Germany had never been invaded. They didn't know that Germany was losing the war. This is something we get from his mother's diary time and time again. Um, so the end of the First World War was, was so huge for somebody like Griesinger and others like him. And it is the Jews who had brought about the end of the First World War, the communists. Like communists and Jews are something that, you know, for his mother at least, come up time and time again. This, this idea that, you know, we, these are the people we really, really need, especially communists actually in the case of his mother. But, you know, they're from Stuttgart. They're not living in Berlin. They're not living in Frankfurt. There aren't that many Jews, let's face it, in a, in a city like Stuttgart. There's only about four, four and a half thousand. Uh, nevertheless, I was able, I went to his high school. I got his high school class, um, the list of students, who were in his class at school. And they're what it always tells you, you know, the religion of the students. Um, so everybody would know who the Jewish child was in a class. And, and I managed to track down uh, this, this one student, Hugo Stern, who would have been in his class at school. Um, uh, there were only 19 Jewish boys in his entire school. There are about 500, 500 boys. Um, but you know, even at Tübingen, at his university, there would have been very, very few, not, what am I talking about? There wouldn't have been any Jews. Tübingen banned Jewish students. It banned Jewish faculty. So we're talking about, 
you know, he probably really, he, apart from Hugo Stern at high school, we can count the number of Jews he knew probably on one hand. But significantly, I would like to mention that, and this was a, one of those moments in the archives where your jaw really does drop. And I'm looking at the, the, the name of everybody on, on his street in Stuttgart, and I'm trying to do some kind of spatial, like thinking where he lived and who were his neighbors. And I've got the next door neighbor in 1936. So the month after he got married in 1936, he moved into this new house and the next door neighbor had the last name Rothschild. And I was thinking, oh my God, you know, how is this even possible? Anyway, I did some work, went to the archives, Clearly, I got the name of this couple, um, Helena and Fritz, Orthodox Jews, members of the synagogue in Stuttgart. So in 19, as late as 1936, he is living next door, this family, the Rothschild. So when I sort of went to this house and visited it for myself, you know, to live next door somebody, it might mean, you know, 200 meters away. I, I wanted to get a sense of what does it mean to live next door a Jewish family when you're uh, in the Gestapo, in the SS, but just visiting this house, you know, it's a semi-detached house. There was just a wall separating the two families. And then when I interviewed the Rothschild's granddaughter, they were very, she was very explicit that her grandparents would have had a mezuzah. They would have lit the Shabbat candle. So this for me was, you know, just trying to get my head around mid 1930s Germany. The fact that this SS officer, Gestapo lawyer is going home every night. You know, they could have taken the bus together. They could, who knows what kind of interaction they had. But at that, and then at that point, in the book, I do start to trace the, the different careers that they have, the, the Roth, what became of the Rothschilds, which is obviously completely different to yes. in some ways to the Greek. Well, he, he ends up um, in concentration camp and she ends up in Wembley where you were born. Yes. That's yes. right, isn't it? It's very interesting. Okay, I just want to check, Steve, how much more time? Because I've got, I mean, I've got loads of things, but I'll, I'll select. Um, Five minutes. I've got a um, couple of questions, but yeah. Okay, so Dan, a couple of other things. There's something very unusual, also. At least I thought it was unusual, but you may tell us it was much more common. Which is that in this family history of Griesinger, there is an American family, um, Germans who'd gone to America and came back, at yeah. different, you know, in different generations, and it's a slave-owning family. Yeah, and you make quite a bit of this in the book. You, you, you point out that, um, for example, the house they built looks like a southern, in Germany, looks like a southern house uh, in America. So there's a, that kind of cultural heritage. But you also think some of the racist tropes that come derived from this slave owning um, German American family are, in are, are, are literally incorporated through, through the being of, of, of Griesinger's mother, isn't it? Um, grandmother. Get grandmother his grandmother father's yeah mother. father's mother yeah 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 so greece just father's mother who comes from america and is full of the racist beliefs that she's grown up with in the american south yeah uh, and you you make that as a link you say this made him as, i mean i think well in fact i've got the quote here. you say um he also inherit as well as inheriting various other things he also inherited an ease with brutally racist attitudes and practices so i'm just uh, again interested here in whether you think that american racism of that period and perhaps of today and nazi ideology were mutually compatible or even in some ways um, interrelated. You know, what, 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 what are you what are you saying there about the kind of um, similarities or sort of distinctions between these different forms of racism? Well, I mean, there, there's some very good work on this has come out recently by by American scholars who've really looked into the inspiration that, that, that sort of went into the thinking behind the Nazi racial laws, and about how some of their inspiration they would sort of send off researchers to the United States in the early 1930s. And they came back to Germany and they would say, oh God, no, it's a bit racist in America. I don't think that would wash here. Like the extent of, of racism in the American South, the fact that, you know, intermarriage between white people and black people was not allowed in 30 states. The fact that um, the state of Mississippi had a one drop rule, which meant, which defined anybody as, as black, as just having one drop of blood, uh, in, 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 you know, within them, you know, for the Nazis, this is like, hold on a second, this is, this is way too racist, even for us. So, you know, we know that in Nazi Germany, they had three, the, the criteria to be a Jew with three Jewish grandparents, of course, which is completely different to, to what was going on uh, in the United States. Look, 
I'm not saying that Griesinger, you, you need to have a grandmother who owned an enslaved person in order to be a Nazi. Of course not, because we know that most people living in Germany in the 1930s and 40s who were Nazis did not have an American slave owning uh, gra grandmother, of course. But what I think I, I, I'm just, I was just very interested in this was the way that I could chart his history back to the 1720s in New Orleans and just look at the numbers, the sheer numbers of people in his family who had owned enslaved people at one time or another. And when somebody as close as his grandmother who did grow up with an enslaved person in her home, not only that, we see by the time we get to the 1870s, the fact that so many, you know, there was just so much racism going on in a city like New Orleans. This was after the Civil War and Reconstruction. And it was something like every other man was a member of a white supremacist organization. This was, this was the environment in which Riesinger's father, Riesinger's grandmother grew up with. Grew up with. So I do make this, this connection that Griesinger inherited a lot of his ideas from the American South. We know from, from the diaries that he was extremely close to his grandmother who moved to Imperial Germany. The family moved to Imperial Germany in the 1880s, which, you know, again, it's something that a lot of historians haven't really thought too much about. Really. I think a lot of people, we think that Europeans would move to America and that was the end of the story. They would sort of set up life there. We forget that one third of uh, these people would come back, this return migration. They either didn't like America for economic reasons or whatever. So his family did move back to Europe. They did take a lot of these ideas with them. And again, like you say, in terms of the house, when I went and saw the blueprints for this house in Stuttgart, well, just as soon as I saw the house, I saw these columns coming up from the front of the house. It didn't look like any of the houses in Stuttgart. And yet, you know, when you look at the blueprints, it's very clear that they wanted this to be designed on their American, uh, on, on, on the property they had owned in, in the American South. The, the, the relationship, what I'm getting at is that the relationship didn't suddenly end when the family left New Orleans to move to Germany. I think Stephen Feldman, I even get, sent you a picture of a house, of a postcard, uh, if we can. Don't worry if we can't, but it's the 10th picture um, I sent you. Just and it, this is a picture sent decades after the family had moved. Just as a, just as as an example that the families were still in touch with each other, the American family and the German family, for many many years. I don't know if we can show that, but don't worry. If, there it yeah. is. Oh, okay. There it is. This is an American house. So this is yes. it is the house. <laughs> you know, it's sent. They sent postcards to each other. So. So yeah, that house is still there, of course, in, in New Orleans in the Garden District. Fantastic. Okay, last question, which was my first one, but it was too long, we didn't get a chance to answer it. So it's a really, it's a fascinating book. I hope people have had a, you know, really appreciated that from what you've been saying, Dan. Um, what would you most want people to take away from it, having, if they've read the book? Uh, well, I suppose thinking a bit about the events of this week that we've lived through, uh, this week, it really has made a lot, a lot of us think a little bit about um, these people at the top who are doing things sometimes politically, some of these very extreme figures and what, what they are saying and how they communicate their message. And I think that one day what we need to do eventually, um, the job of the historian when thinking about 2020 or the last five years and why people have, might have turned to some of these sort of extreme views and these extreme personalities, it might be interesting to actually look more at the people underneath, these, these enablers, the people who are allowing them the space, the people who are supporting them and giving them, um, you know, what makes people attracted to this message and why. So I think for me that, that for me is one of the most important things of, of, I think, of my book, that I wanted to look at one enabler who, you know, there just hasn't been much work on anyone apart from when we look at these individual Nazis, we look at, of course, at those at the top. We look at Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich. We look, there's plenty of work done on all of these people. There's plenty of work done on individual killers, but just on, on one of these ordinary enablers. For me, that was, that was, you know, the real point of my book to sort of return texture and agency to people 
who, you know, as I said earlier, were one of these 8 million Nazi party members and to see sort of what, motiv what motivated them and what sort of propelled them forward. Great, thanks, Dan. That's brilliant. Steve, over to you. Okay, Daniel, first of all, thank you very, very much. Um, as you know, I read your book just before it was published and uh, I, was, I was so captivated by it. Um, and I've got a couple of questions for you here. Um, you talked about denial um, in post-war Germany, in the second generation of post-war Germany. But um, my recollection of post-war English, English Jews was that there was a silence in England as well. Um, we didn't talk, you know, I think I was 20, it was 1970 before I even knew what the Holocaust was, right? And, you know, from other people in my generation, that's not uncommon. And I just wonder, do you see any parallels between the silence of the descendants of the Nazis and the silence of the relatives of the victims? That's a great question, thank you. I haven't thought about that before, but I think what, uh, from what I understand, I think a lot of people, they're, they're, you're absolutely right to talk about this silence, because again, we see this in lots of countries in Europe, not just in England, that people didn't want, didn't talk about the Holocaust for, for quite a long time. But I think in some of the most amazing work that I've been reading quite recently in the last five years, by, by scholars like David Cesarani and others, what I think I'm seeing is this look towards Jews who did try to talk about what had happened to them in Nazi Germany or in concentration camps. Uh, and there was actually a, a, um, a willingness to want to talk about this as early as 45, 46. But then there was often the sort of rejection by those around them, people being told, no, don't talk about this. So people were actually, from what I'm understanding of the sources at the moment, there was a real willingness for some Jews to want to talk about their stories, but for the local either non-Jewish population, just not, not to want to hear about it in the same way. I don't know. I think it was in the Jewish community. I mean, you know. Well, that's completely right. Can I just come I in and like say- that part of the children. Um, you know. it, wasn't, it wasn't that. It was a failure to receive the testimonies. That's, and that's what, that's what Dan's describing there. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear if you read some of particularly of the second generation stuff, for example, even, even now written quite a long time ago, Eva Hoffman's book, After Such Knowledge, she describes her parents talking to other Holocaust survivors, but no one else because they were rebuffed all the time. And there was a lot published at the end of the 1940s. I mean, Dan will know this, you know, in Polish and Yiddish never got translated yeah but we were there were plenty of voices it's the it's the primo levi dream you know where he says they had this common dream in ashford so you come you, you survive and you tell people and they don't believe it that, yeah i think it's the, even today you know, when we look at some of the yizkor books that were published in the late 1940s each of these shtetls in East, eastern europe completely destroyed people the few survivors who who did return or who did uh, survive these experiences would, would sort of form little communities together and would write and record the story of their shtetl. And these were written in Yiddish in the late 1940s and only in the last few years are we seeing these being translated uh, into English. And most of these are available online now. So if you know the shtetl that your, your parents or grandparents had came from, you are now able in English to go online and find out all kinds of information about it by those who were writing about it in the late 1940s. Okay, and my last question for you. Um, I think you've portrayed, um, when I read the book, I was struck by the title of Hannah Arendt's book, The Banality of Evil, you know, I mean, and I don't think I'd ever fully appreciated it, the resonance of that until I read the book. Um, but you've, you talk in the book about how Griesinger wasn't uh, an ideological Nazi. He wasn't particularly driven by any, any philosophy or anything. He was simply a careerist out to do the best for himself and his family. And I just wonder, um, and he wasn't the only one. 
But what does that say about humanity? Um, if they could, if Friesinger could do this in those circumstances, what does it say to all of us? Well, I think for somebody like Griesinger, and you know, you've, you've read my book, so you, so you, you know this, but Griesinger essentially isn't getting his hands dirty. He's not seeing what's happening to the people whose lives he is changing. He is not, a, you know, holding a gun. He is not in a concentration camp, okay? In, um, in the Gestapo, in the SS, what he's doing is he's a lawyer. He is at his desk, he's at his typewriter. He is sending out uh, a lot of, inf he's sending out a lot of circulars across the state of Württemberg, across Stuttgart, to make sure that local people are following procedure. People are being rounded up and brought into uh, the torture chamber in the basement of his office block. And he knows what's going on there, but he's not actually doing any of the sort of the torturous stuff himself with his own hands. And the same thing is happening when we get to Prague and he's responsible for the roundup and deportation of local men who are being sent and women who are being sent away to do forced labor there. So I think there's a real disjoint, a disconnection here between the people we often think, the people uh, like Christopher Browning, Daniel Goldhug, and these people who have written about these people who are these, these squadrons, these units of actual, of, of, of killers who are, have the, uh, the guns in their hands every day uh, and who saw their victims, and victims knew who, who was the person responsible for what was, what was happening to them. Whereas I think we, we just need to remember that for most of these people uh, who are upstairs, so to speak, these mid-ranking mid people who wore the suits every day to work, who were sometimes hundreds of miles away from the killing fields. I do think, uh, you know, the situation was probably a little bit different. Okay, um, Daniel, I want to, um, I'm going to ask everybody in a second to unmute themselves. Um, I just want to say to anybody who's, you know, most of you won't have read Daniel's book. Um, it's a combination of, a detective story and a history. Um, it's relevant to all of us. It's a fascinating, it's an easy read. I really encourage you, go out and buy it so that he earns a little bit of royalties and read it because it is a powerful read and it will leave you thinking and um, it will prompt conversation over the dinner table.